Okay, so hi everybody, um, my name is Volker Butzek. Um, I'll today not do a tutorial of sorts, I'll just uh, recount an experience. And the experience is about uh, achieving persistence uh, with UI5 on iOS. And uh, so first things first, um, this is the company I work for called JNS Soft. I uh, don't want to uh, spend too much time on this slide just to mention um, I work as an architect in the sub UI5 and the gateway area and currently also working for SAP so we are sorts of colleagues um, for the uh, exchange media project that you might or might not have heard of. And um, to give you an idea about um, why we came up with uh, the persistence thing is um, I'd like to show you guys something and while I clicky click here um, uh, some of you are into the diving, into scuba diving? Yep. Yeah, hands up. Okay, so uh, at JNS we're also quite a couple of scuba divers and um, when the entire UI5 topic came up and there was a team um, put into place for diving, uh, for diving, for, <laughs> for UI5, diving into UI5, we were thinking about you know what to do in order to grow as a team and develop some skills. So we decided um, to come up with an app as an internal project. And since uh, most of us are divers, we thought, hmm, why not do a dive log of sorts? And uh, I'd really like to show it to you now. Probably, oh, yeah. Huh? Okay, connection is really slow here. So I'll hold it up like so. So this is, this is all UI5, yeah, this is location-based. I can probably pass it around so you can have a look. Um, this is a, a gyroscope-based kind of a thing in UI5 where you can see a, a 3D rendered picture of, uh, of some fish <laughs> swimming around. And um, parts of that app involves taking pictures and once the iPhone comes back to me I'll show you <laughs> which iPhone <laughs> let me kill this you can all have a look and uh, the use case inside the app is actually pretty simple it's this so you're at a dive site, yeah, with your dive log. You had a cool dive, you think, okay, I need a picture of this one. So you have the opportunity to take a picture. You raise the phone, you shoot the picture, and then, of course, you expect the picture to be stored. And um, all of us naively thought in the beginning that, well, okay, no big deal, yeah? We have sub UI5, we're pretty good at that. So we'll take a Cordova container, we'll take the plugin, the camera plugin, then just wrap the application inside a Cordova, Cordova container, deploy it, and uh, then it's on the device. And whatever is stored there will remain on the device. Now, well, guess what? We were wrong. <laughs> so, first thing we tried was using web storage. So this is both uh, local storage and session, ses session storage. Session storage is supposed to be permanent. Uh, local storage is supposed to be permanent and session storage, of course, pertains to the session. Now, what we found out actually by accident in the first place was um, the functions provided by the UI5 framework store stuff. But once the iOS decides, hey, I'm running out of storage space on the device, I'll just free some. <laughs> and guess what it frees first? It frees first all web-related stuff. And since you're running in a web view container, it frees your pictures as well. <laughs> and there you are. You've got your 112 dives locked. And when you lock the 113th, all of a sudden, boom, your picture's gone. So bad idea. Then we were looking at, hmm, OK, let's use WebSQL as a standard and do it manually on the device. Same thing, uh, some of you might have already used it, WebSQL. It's a relational database of sorts uh, in the web. Now, guess what? Deprecated. So there's no further development um, in any browser, which means there's not going to be any more development in any web view. 
Next thing we were looking at is IndexedDB, ob Object Relational Database, also in the browser. Um, already when looking at it in iOS, we didn't even bother going to Android. No support in the iOS 8 WebView world, and with iOS 9, super buggy. Like, you could not reproduce any results. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Then, hmm, there's the shiny new HTML5 world. Why not try the file system API and the file writer? Well, surprise, surprise, no iOS support. <laughs> then we were thinking, okay, just n let's not look at it from the storage perspective. Let's first start with an operating system. So we first looked at iOS. What can you do there in the web view context? And it turns out, not much. <laughs> Because what's happening is when you store files are larger than five megabyte, sometimes a pop-up comes up, sometimes it doesn't, asking the user, do you want to allow this application to store more than five megabytes? Now, if it comes up, it's not looking well, but at least you can say yes. If it doesn't come up, your picture will go nowhere. And then also, 50 meg is the hard limit. No more than 50 meg in the iOS web views. So, first thing was clear, we're not going anywhere with the web view implementation, we need to go one layer down to the OS. And also looking at all those different things like local storage, web SQL, index to be so on and so forth, it's clear that we need an abstraction layer of sorts, so we don't have to manually code for every container that we're deploying the app on. Yeah, so no Android specific coding, no iOS and so on and so forth. Then came the research time. Um, first requirement for the two things I just said was it needs to work with base 64 strings and not with blobs, meaning you have a static picture that you want to store. We didn't want this because the camera API from the Cordova layer gives you the picture as a base 64 string cross platform. So that was clear. Then again, of course, we wanted to have unlimited storage. Yeah. The next really important thing was whatever we are going to use, it should not block the UI. So when you take your photo, you should be able to immediately continue working with the app. And then for the first step, we said, let's skip Android. We'll stick with iOS because most of us are pretty literate with iOS and not so much in the Android world. So that's it. And then, last but not least, of course, you've taken your 112 dive pictures and it's on the device and all of a sudden you get a new iPhone. Hmm. So, wouldn't it be nice to have some sort of sync or replication capability for this? And um, what we found was, and some of you might even know it already, a library called PouchDB. Um, PouchDB is um, the JavaScript implementation of CouchDB. Huh? obviously, and um, this is a NoSQL database that's used, um, I'd say, pretty extensively in the development world already, CouchDB, I mean, and PouchDB, of course, being in the JavaScript world was our um, thing of choice. But that only gave us the storage abstraction layer. Now, in order to store stuff on the OS layer, on iOS, we found um, the Cordova SQLite storage plugin for Cordova. And what you can do is you can hook up PouchDB to using this SQLite storage adapter and it will actually give you what you want, unlimited storage and storage in an SQL database on the OS layer in iOS. Now, some of you are already thinking ahead and you're right about this because what's happening is of course this. In addition to PouchDB, in addition to the SQLite storage thing, we actually have one layer below the SQLite software on the iOS device and on top we have UI5. So when you take your picture with the phone, <laughs> the thing needs to pass all the layers until it's really persisted on the OS. And um, on the next couple of screens, I'm going to show you some implementation hints, how we did it. And uh, probably some of you have comments on that or even better suggestions. Um, 
the first thing is promises. You guys know about promises in JavaScript? It's literally, oops, sorry, it's literally a promise. So you send off a request of sorts, the request runs, 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 and will get back to you either in an OK state or with an error. And this is uh, ES5, ES6 JavaScript, and it's got support in most browsers, excluding some early versions of Internet Explorer, but us being in the iOS world was of no concern to us. So what you see here is you instantiate the promise, and at some point you resolve it or you reject it. And you resolve it with some arbitrary value, meaning of sorts you return the function, or you reject it with some sort of error message. This is the basic principle of promises. And um, when you combine this with PouchDB, PouchDB itself is also very heavily relying on promises. It also got a callback API, but it's a whole lot more convenient to use promises. So you instantiate a PouchDB instance, then you prepare a document to be inserted. Remember, this is no SQL. This is not SQL insert into values, parentheses, so on and so forth. You insert documents, you retrieve documents. You don't insert rows or anything. Also, no HANA where you insert columns, yeah? So at least you need an ID. This is the unique key still in, of sorts. And then you can just throw in whatever arbitrary key value pairs you want in such a document. Also, arrays work. After you've set up your doc, you start the promisey thing. So you go, hey database, put my document. Since it's implemented in a promise way, you can say then, meaning afterwards. You retrieve it again for illustration purposes here. And you see it's very heavily relying on uh, functional programming, so you receive function as arguments and also arguments to the function, as in here. When you put a document, you get no return of sorts. It's either there when it's in, to, in the database or down here when an error happens. And then you can do whatever you want with the error that comes from there. After you've stored it, you want to retrieve it again, as I said, for illustration purposes. So you do database get with your unique key that you've provided up here. And important is to return it, so the promise actually returns a result, which is the document itself. And then here, just also for illustration purposes, you lock the doc or what, whatever is inside the doc. Now combine this with the camera API. Most of you know this, and you might have already used it. You go navigate the camera, you get picture, then you provide a success callback, error callback, and you have certain options for the camera. Now, I said we're using, prom we're using a promisey approach, so we uh, want to avoid callback, you know, to have some, at some point the callback held down there where you have indentations like, you know, diff, 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 the train, yeah? So what you do is you wrap a callback function inside a promise. So, see the notation here with function resolve reject? That's just shorthand for the first slide I showed, showed where you have resolve reject as actual function calls. So, this is the shell, and inside you simply put navigate the camera get picture. When it worked, resolve it, and you'll get the binary, uh, the, the um, base64 string back, or reject it, and you get the error back, and the options are still the same. Yeah. And when you then combine this promisey take picture function with the actual UI, then you would do it in such a way. First you go take picture. After you've taken the picture, you've received the base64 string. If there's an error, you get the error down here and you catch it in general for everything. Now, first thing you want to do is <laughs> Use the event bus and uh, lock the UI. Or in any other way, indicate to the user, hey, I'm doing something here. Don't worry, we're still working. Then you're preparing your document. 
And it's, it's the same thing like I've showed on the previous slide, only that when you store documents with PouchDB or let's say big documents with PouchDB, you should use attachments. They're supposed to be the binary companion of actual records, I'd say, in the PouchDB world. So this is only to indicate something a little different when you set up the document and then you put the document into the database. And now it goes all the way down there through the SQLite bridge into the SQL database. After you've done that, you of course should unlock the UI or indicate in any other way that you're done working. And um, as I said down here, you can do in the catch function whatever you want. Important is probably the last part, yeah? Very common mistake. When an error happens, you still have the UI locked. Not so good. Now let me show you the live example for this. Um, in the browser at least. So, um, I've got uh, a ground server running here. And the ground server is running a couple of unit tests and it shows you the result for inserting um, different sizes of pictures in quotes. So these are just random base64 strings, but could be pictures, yeah? So you see for uh, 100K, it takes about 97 meg, uh, milliseconds. And when you then increase it, 500K, 1 meg, 3 meg, 5 meg, uh-huh. And when you're inserting 10 meg, you're already at two seconds. This is the entire stack passing through until you're on the OS layer. Now this is on a Mac OS X machine with a dual core and 60 meg RAM. Now you transfer all of that into the mobile world where all of a sudden performance becomes a really big issue. And what you end up with is a graph like this. So I took eight measurements or series measurements. These are actually four graphs down here and this is the desktop that you've just seen. So the 10 mag thing which is the sixth one here takes about between a little more than two seconds and 2.2 seconds or so in general. Now this is on my iPhone. This is iPhone 6, so not the latest, but still not so bad, yeah? Running the latest iOS. And you can see, storing stuff is exponentially expensive. Yeah? Did you do this test uh, with a native app too, or just with UI5 combined with Cordova and so on? Yeah, question was, native also done? No, I have no comparison for native. So this is only for the entire stack passing through from take picture to when it's actually on the OS. And what that me meant for us very specifically in development is we only can provide pictures up to a certain size. So everything that's bigger than five megabyte here doesn't work anymore. Nobody will wait that long in the first place. And also in the second place, we couldn't really how should I put it? We couldn't reproduce a substantial result. What happens when you lock the phone or do something like turn it off or whatever while the operation is still in place? Yeah, so in theory, the rollback should happen. In practice, it doesn't always. And it's simply too dangerous. Oops simply too dangerous to rely on that. So for us it was clear anything bigger than five megabyte is no go. So all the pictures in the app are five megs only. Have you been able to find out where the time is lost? Is it the base 64 or is it the PouchDB or, or is it the Cordova layer? Or? Question was where was the time lost? And the main time loss is between um, or after Pouch and before the OS. So it's actually the implementation, I would think, of the SQLite adapter for Cordova. Did you not 
2 und nachher äh, JavaScript Framework, der ist Local Forge von, von Mozilla, that's the equivalent to HTTP, that you try something else or just HTTP? A question was anything else tried than PouchDB? No, it was just PouchDB. Because getting that set up in a way that you can develop productively was for us expensive enough in terms of manpower. I mean, I'm pretty sure any of you who've debugged apps in Cordova on the iPhone, not so cool. Did you try going straight to SQLite instead of going your pouch? Can you go straight to the SQLite connector? No, you can. You have to use some intermediary to. Yeah. The question was, can you basically push whatever it is directly to the SQLite connector? No, you can. No. And uh, I mean, there's also some good answer to things because you find out a lot of about storage um, approaches in the different browsers and OSs. And what I find found really impressive was that all vendors, no matter whether it's Firefox or Chrome or whatever, are smart enough that, you wanna tr that if you try to store the same base 64 string multiple times, it will only store pointers. So, you know, it's a pretty, pretty easy uh, use case, you would think. I take one picture and store it 5,000 times, and then I have 2.5 gigabyte. Uh -uh. <laughs> You'll have the five meg of the one picture actually in storage in the OS. So you have to emulate, minimize your base 64 string every time. How is the native camera up storing the pictures? Why can't you grab the original picture from the camera up? Our question was, um, why not use the, the real camera app and not use it via Cordova? Because then it would require you to write a native app where you have a part only web view and the rest you need to do native and we didn't want to do this. We actually wanted to learn how far can you push UI5 in doing this. Or utilize UI5, not push UI5. And I mean what you guys have probably seen, UI5 goes a long way. Yeah? You can even do gyroscope, 3D kind of a things. We never thought that would be possible, but it is. And also the entire theming, there is no blue crystal anymore. Yeah. So you can do this as well, theming. But um, when it comes to permanently storing data, you need to have a really close look on the user experience, I'd say, most importantly. Yeah, so that's me, and uh, these are the credits. The Noun Project is a cool icon library if you want to look at that sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, guys. Yeah.